So I guess we have to, to start this then. Yeah. Okay. Any any time now. Any time now. It's already 10 15. This okay. movie was so long. This movie was a zillion years long. I've died and been reincarnated and made the same decisions that brought me <laughs> here. Oh my god. Welcome to the Cinderella podcast, where we watch and review every extremely questionable Cinderella adaptation we can get our hands on, discussing the same story over and over, even though we've already gone insane. I'm Liv. And I'm Talon. And today we watched The Slipper and the Rose from 1976. Uh, We're calling it the Please Stop Singing Cinderella. This was a British uh, musical film. And it was two hours and 20 minutes long. And every minute of that sure did feel like an hour. It did. This movie was on a lot of top 10 lists that I've seen. And so I was really, really pumped to watch it. And I remained that way for the first, I would say, hour. But listeners, I want you to know that at the hour mark, Cinderella arrives at the ball and there's not much left of the Cinderella story after that but somehow there is still an hour and 10 minutes left of the movie and at that point my sanity started to edge out of the room quietly. I mean I liked it up until they decided to just start filming a completely different second movie at the end of the first movie. Yeah, caveat, everyone who wants to make a Cinderella, just make a Cinderella. Don't add a second story on the end. It's going to be fine. We'll like it, we promise. If we wanted to watch a different story, we would watch a different story. Just tell us about Cinderella, make it stop. It's totally fine to add another story on top of the Cinderella story, but for goodness sake, like, pepper it in there. Don't just save it all until the very end and go, oh, by the way, Here's a whole other story. Here's a whole other story. All right. So. So we start with trumpety music and then just the longest intro in the entire universe. There are life forms that we don't even understand yet who would measure their like entire span of time by this intro. Yes. Uh, What we visually see are people on horses with flags riding through snowy trees. Oh, but Liv, is it snowy there? It is snowy. I, they show us, I didn't count the scene numbers, but it is four solid minutes. I did count the minutes of no sound from the movie. We get essentially Monty Python music to start, and then we cut into, I swear, in my own little corner, I disagree. It sounds like that. The first couple of notes are the same and then it changes. It's not exactly that song. But we we just get this weird song that goes on and on. It doesn't have any words, thank God. It, but it's it just, just sounds kind of happy. Like it, it goes up, up, up and then it goes down, down, down. 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 Yeah. And then trumpets and then up, up, up and then down, down, down. And it just keeps doing that. And all we can gather from this information is that A, it's snowy there, and Mm -hmm. B, someone is arriving somewhere. Yes, for four minutes. Oh, I'm so sorry, no, for six minutes. There are important trumpet sound at at the five minute mark. So at the six minute mark of snowy trees and distant horses, we cut to a room and the prince stomps in. And he is also mad about how many trumpets there were. So I initially liked the prince a whole bunch. Okay. All I could think of was Hugh Laurie's character on Black Adder. Yes. As the prince. Yes. And they even have like a slight similarity in their facial structure. You know, long faces. This is played by Richard Chamberlain. Yeah. Sure. Sure. But he was a real heartthrob back in the day, I guess. And he's sort of long-faced and high forehead, and he has curly brown hair. It's pulled back into a ponytail. 
This is set in the 1780s ish in a a made up country. Yeah, called Euphrania, which is unclear where it is. It is possibly England, but possibly a tiny, tiny country. It's supposed to be very small and very inconsequential, but they do say that they are in Europe. I want, I want to believe that this is the most pristine, serene Republic of San Marino, which is the third tiniest country in the world. It is a mountain in Italy. That's it. It's just one mountain in Italy that is its own wee ickle country. So I like to think that that is what Euphrania is. Okay. Sure. I didn't have to look that information up, by the way. That's something that is just stored in my head forever. As oh, opposed I didn't to doubt that for a moment. Where my keys are or anything. So the prince is complaining about trumpets. And he says, well, why can't a prince come home without a fuss? And he's predicting how long it will take the annoying Lord High Chamberlain to greet him. And sure enough, right on time, the annoying Lord High Chamberlain arrives to bug him about where he's been and whether or not he is betrothed because where he was, was visiting another kingdom to propose to that princess to form an alliance of state. However, he declined. And he, didn't, he didn't decline, he just didn't propose. Yes, he did not propose. My first musical note, two paragraphs in is, oh God, we get a song about how the prince wants to marry for love. This is barely a song. This is three notes held together with silly putty. None of the songs in this thing are songs. All BT the dubs. songs are so bad. They're so bad. It's maybe five notes. No one knows about jumps. You can only go up a note or down a note or stay on the same note. None of them have like a melody that's like different from no. each other no. or like interesting. No one here has heard of a hook. Nope. The only thing I can remember about some of the songs is that they reminded me of other songs that had hooks. So it was just like very bland and went on for so long. So the prince sings the song about how he doesn't have like the ability to choose in love and how uh, he wishes that he could be two people and one can be all dutiful and the other one can be like free and happy. And he just keeps singing about it and keeps singing about it. Every song goes on at least two and a half times longer than it should. And most of the songs get a very unfortunate reprise. So this song happens just roaming from room to room. The prince is just strolling manfully from room to room singing about how annoying it is to be a prince and have all the advantages of princedom. He, he, this isn't just us like being like, you know, caddy. No, that, that Those literally are the is his complaint is that he's a prince and that's why he doesn't get to choose. Mm-hmm. And like, if only he was like a peasant, then he'd be able to choose love. And it, it must be so nice being a peasant. Mm-hmm. That will be a theme throughout the entire movie, by the way. We get multiple songs on that theme. Uh, he storms into the throne room and the king is going to give him the knighthood of the Knight Grand Cross of the Most Noble, noble Order of St. David, the Blessed Martyr. And the prince is trying to explain that he does not deserve this because this is supposed to be an honor that he gets because he proposed to this princess, which he didn't do. So he's trying to explain that to the king who's just talking over him. The king gets a lot of funny lines that are just sort of one-liners set out of nowhere. And one of them comes now where the prince says, but father, I haven't earned this. And the king says, nonsense, no one earns this. It's just because I'm king and I like it, which... The king understands the world. I, I liked him. They're also playing some sort of game with big dice and a lot of servants in oh black and God. white outfits. I completely forgot about the dice. It's very big dice. And this is what they've interrupted with this whole knighthood thing. The queen declares that she does so love a ceremony. She likes the bit where they kiss. On the cheeks. Sometimes she gives on the out- cheek. Sometimes she gives out medals to the whole regiment so she can kiss them all on the cheek. So already I like the queen. (laughs) By the way, when we say massive dice, dice implies plural. It's a die the size of a bowling ball. Sure. But made out of styrofoam, but it sounds like wood, but it moves like styrofoam. And the king rolls it and says, black five. All of the pips on the die are black. So I don't know... 
and five servants in black hop to a different place. So this seems to be chess, but with dice, a di- but with a die and die. And if you know what this game is, please explain it to us. Please. This, they're playing Calvin Ball. Moving on. The prince explains that Selena is not beautiful, which is why he didn't propose to her. She is sickly and wan. She is bald. Her golden hair is a wig. She doesn't have any teeth. Her face has lines on it. And then their cousin comes into the room. And this is Cousin Montague, and they hate him. They're like, who let him in? This is the annoying duke. He's, he's announced as the annoying duke. Oh, excellent. He inspects the, the big metal. It's a giant metal on the prince's chest. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like making a face like, mm, this isn't great. And then we get a song from the king and queen, even though we literally just had a song and we have done nothing to deserve this. There is nothing that will protect you from a song happening. There will be no warning. It will just happen to you. Even if you think you're in that lull between songs, you're not. A song can come out of anywhere, anytime. Nothing can protect you. The song will always find you. Abandon all hope. So this song is about the king and queen singing about how marrying for love is stupid. It's basically what has love got to do with getting married? you know we didn't need that we're doing fine love is like silly just Uh, find a mate yeah that's the cat that's the i'm gonna use hook with big quotation marks but that's the hook is find a mate dear boy and at one point we get the line what has bread got to do with wedding cake at which point my notes devolve into chaos because i love cooking and a lot of similar ingredients a lot bread has a lot to do with wedding cake and then the annoying cousin is like, oh, I couldn't have said it any better myself. Or, I mean, I could have. And yeah, actually, I will. Um, and then he sings about, like, what is marriage to do with being happy? Like, you can just be happy because you're royal and I'm happy. Can you just describe this annoying duke for our beloved listeners who did not get the pleasure of watching this thing? The annoying duke is, like, less attractive. He has a bigger face. He's also coded as very queer, and he's very, very camp. Yes. He's just over the top everything. We spend a good part of the movie trying to decide if the movie knows that he's gay or not. I thought at first that the joke was that he's gay. When he's singing about how you don't need marriage. To be happy. To be happy, you can just be happy. I thought that was, like, obviously queer coded. Yeah, but then later... It's not, and I I suppose you could make an argument that he's somewhere in the middle of the Kinsey scale and is attracted to multiple genders of people, but the movie gets real confused and tries to just portray him as flamboyant and annoying, but he's so aggressively gay. Whether they know it or not, they've created a very gay character. It's, It's jarring in this movie is what I'll say. It's not that I didn't like it. It was just jarring every time he was on screen. Well, I just didn't trust the movie to, like, handle having a gay character. Oh, no. Like, so I kept it, waiting for, like, some joke at his expense. And the joke which, seemed to mostly be that he's very foppish. Which is fine. It, nothing bad wound up happening with that. That was good. Yeah. So we finish the song and we cut to a lake with a bridge over it and four women walking who we have not met and can't see clearly. And one of them says, thank goodness that's over and done with. And as the song just ended, I find myself in agreement with this lady. (laughs) Thank God. Thank God that is over and done with. It is the stepmother. She and her daughters and Cinderella arrive back at home and they take off their black cloaks and they're talking about how dull everything was. And I got that they are coming home from the father's funeral. Yes. Did you get that? Okay. Yes. I I described it as a funeral procession. Yes. And so the stepmother is in the front with the two daughters and then Cinderella was trailing like far behind. And when the stepmother takes off her cloak, she's wearing this bright red dress underneath. Oh yeah. And the two stepsisters are wearing bright yellows and she does a sort of like black was never my color, but Cinderella, and it's obviously Cinderella is in the back and 
she's still wearing her cloak and she's the only one that looks sad and somber and she's the only one wearing a dark dress. Mm -hmm. And she starts to go up the stairs and the stepmother asks her where she's going. And Cinderella says, to my room. To which the stepmother replies, your room. I own all the rooms in this house. And she goes on a very weird rant about how the father is dead now, which, thank you, movie, we sort of picked that up, and is buried in the same grave as the mother. Yeah, she goes, he's dead and buried beneath the snow in the same grave as your dear mother. So, I mean, there, there's plots where you, you buy two plots together so that you can be married, buried next to somebody. But, but usually dig somebody up and throw you someone don't, else in. You don't normally do that. You normally spring for, for two coffins. I have questions. I don't want to have questions. I don't want the answers. Let me be clear. I just have questions. So this moment is very tense. And Cinderella yells, my father never loved you. You tricked him. And the stepmother goes, how dare you, madam? Which is a great line. But Cinderella stands her ground and yells back, you tricked him. And the stepmother backs off and goes, well, if I did, he didn't live to rue the day, which cold. And then she tells her to cultivate humility and to know her present place and assigns her all these chores. And Cinderella yells, I hate you. I hate you all. So in the father's will, she is given legal custody of Cinderella. And she says that out of respect for her father's memory, she will continue to house her and feed her. But for financial reasons, she's dismissed all the servants and Cinderella will now live downstairs and do 100% of the chores. Mm -hmm. So they tell Cinderella that she will cook, carry, fetch, and mend, or she will go to the orphanage. And one of the stepsisters goes, they tell me Cinderella one can be awfully happy there. And tells her some horrible things about them sleeping six to a bed if you don't count the rats yeah at which point the stepmother tells her daughters not to tease as it spoils their looks the stepsisters and stepmother leave and go upstairs just continuing to bicker oh you cannot walk away before that line what line so she demands that cinderella make some soup and then she goes marrying a husband is a cold business and sadly i have very two and then the stepdaughters go, poor mama. Right. Yeah, I blocked that line. I just, I just thought that was important. Okay, so let's describe Cinderella and the step family just real quick because we haven't done this and this is a good time to do so. Oh, you're right. Okay. Yeah. So first of all, this is set in about the 1780s and the costumery in this is actually really nice. The colors are, and it's the 70s, so everything is, but... Overall, it was really good. The, the shapes were good. The decorations, the ruffles, general sizing, everything was lovely. It was a little bit pared down and a little bit 70s, 70, 70s sized. That thing where the 70s ruins everything in some slight way. But overall, it was lovely. The stepsisters are both pretty. There's a red haired one and a blonde one, and they just look very average. They're reasonably pretty. Um, the stepmother is very striking. She has very pointed features, but is also very pretty. She has a very arresting personality. Cinderella is wearing this really pretty purple dress, dark purple blue. It has a triangle insert in the bodice with ribbons and lace sleeves and a lace tuck going over the sort of over her cleavage over the bodice and just a gentle full skirt it's not ridiculous hoops but it's not flat it's really lovely gathered like it's just really pretty and it her was hair's, very very pretty and her hair's up in a half bun where the top half of her hair is up in a pretty loose bun and the rest is ringlets flowing softly around her and she has very sweet features she's got a very you know pert up tilted nose and wide blue eyes and a pointed chin she's just very classically pretty yes and she goes downstairs now because she's not allowed to have her own room now. She goes downstairs to the kitchen, which is supposed to look very ominous. But my immediate response was, this is gorgeous. I love it. Dibs. I mean, there was also the table with the leftover food uh, just crawling with mice. There were very cute little white mice, but it was like just mice crawling through bread. 
okay, but it's this big, beautiful stonework. It has a massive staircase, a reading nook, well, what could easily be a reading nook under the stairs, big, beautiful wooden table, beautiful sidebar. Just, this is a really pretty room. And I really liked it. And admittedly, there were mice on the gorgeous, thick, heavy wooden table. Not ideal, but mice are movable. <laughs> so Cinderella and her family live in a castle, basically. And I kept getting confused between their home, which is castle and the castle, which is where castle-y. the prince lives, which is also castle Yeah. But so I'm going to call this the manor. Yes. But it's a castle. But but it's spring now is what's happening. There's spring. They want us to be... Oh, they want us to know it's spring. Oh, yeah. okay. I get it now. Yeah. It's I just spring wrote now. everything is very green. It's because it's spring. Time has passed. Because they spent six minutes showing us snow. Now they need to establish that there's no snow now. The snow okay. is no okay. more. So Cinderella is just running around picking flowers and singing a song. And the song goes... Once I was loved, I knew I was loved. And it basically gets to the point of my heart will not despair because it's just a memory away. And she ends the song gathering flowers in the cemetery. And it's, it's an overgrown cemetery. It's very beautiful. It's so beautiful. It's creepy. It's got these wrought iron filigree gravestones and they're gorgeous and creepy i love old cemeteries it has a cherub statue that's overgrown with moss and vines and sort of cracked and lying on its side and i just i want to go there i want to look at the graves i want to see what's happening there it looks like a lovely place for a picnic so as the song ends men are riding through the nearby field laughing and cinderella hides behind a tree to watch them and she's smiling. She's interested in this. Yes. They, they dismount in front of this beautiful church near this cemetery. And we find out that this is the prince and his best friend, manservant, John. We don't Wikipedia get their names. Wikipedia says that later. he's the bodyguard. Bodyguard? He's referred to as companion at arms, I think. Well, at arms could mean that he's supposed to guard him. He is given a sword later, or rather the other dude is. I think he might actually be the prince's bodyguard. I think this checks out. Uh, Okay, okay. So John, the prince's bodyguard, they go into this beautiful church, and the prince talks about how he's always been fascinated by this church, not because of destiny or morbid curiosity, but because he was taken there as a child and shown the massive marble coffin that is waiting for him. And we get another song. But guys, I want you to know, we're in a big church with a lot of big sarcophagi. And the song is, I'm trying so hard not to swear. You guys can't hear it, but I am swallowing. It's a polka. Oh, it, it's a polka. It is a ho, ho, ho. And it's talking about how comforting it is to know that He's going to die and be buried here no matter what. It's sort of a cheerful nihilism song about, well, no matter how bad my mistakes make, I will still die and go here. And they talk about all the old kings that are buried there. And this one was a lech and this one was drunk and this one was stupid and this one was fat and this one was good, but he's buried here with everybody else. And they're leaping about from coffin to coffin and they're doing gymnastics from coffin to coffin they're clicking their heels and then there's a trapeze number because there's uh, there are archways in this church and there are iron bars between the arches and these two gentlemen decide to do trapeze numbers while singing a polka about death And they end it on a truly impressive front balance, which for those who don't know, is where you put whatever you're balancing on right around your hip bones and you just balance there without touching anything, holding your body in a stiff plank. It's really hard to do because balance 
is weird, especially if you're in the air and you have to hold your body very tight. I also do aerials. I do, I do silks. So front balances, I have strong feelings about them. And they really hurt when it's metal. Metal is painful to balance. Again, want to be clear, on your hip bones. But they do so, continuing to sing a polka, and they end the song by falling flat on their backs on two sarcophagi lids. And I, at this point, started to be done with this movie. Oh, this was the high point for me. Because this is the only musical number I like was even remotely interested in. Yes, which is why it's going to be done, because it continues to go nowhere but down from here. No, correct. But at the moment, we had no reason to know that. Or I mean, we had reason to know that, but we we didn't know for sure. We did not. So this so, whole time Cinderella mm-hmm. is peeking through the window and she's kind of like looking and she's interested and then they notice her. So she runs away and the prince is like, who was that? That girl hiding there, a servant girl. And his built in mandatory best friend is like, I don't know. Mandatory I best friend. Yeah. So Cinderella goes home and is immediately confronted by her stepmother who yells at her because she went to her parents' grave. And the stepmother says, you stole the flowers from my garden and says that she must be punished because she is a conniving thief, takes her down below stairs. And we find out that they're going to be having a fancy guest party and Cinderella must prepare all the food and that she's literally confined to that single room and she may not leave it without the stepmother's express permission. Yep. So in the next scene, we're back to the prince and his BFF, John. And he goes, John, have you ever wished you were in love? And John goes, well, I am in love, actually. And it turns out that he's in love with the lady Caroline, who's the lady in waiting to the prince's grandmother. And the prince is like, wow, how extraordinary. I mean, not extraordinarily extraordinary, but I was surprised. I I found the prince's sort of buffoonery very charming. He was a little ditzy. And like I said, he reminds me a lot of Hugh Laurie in (laughs) Blackadder. Yeah, I would have found that, but I I felt that he took himself too seriously. And so he just came across as extremely pompous and I didn't enjoy it. So the prince says that he will go congratulate Lady Caroline on John being in love with her. And John basically goes, no, please don't do that. I am a servant and positions matter. I cannot tell her of my love for I am a lowly servant. By the way, the John Caroline arc will continue through this entire movie. Do you know who we don't ever meet? It's Caroline. We never meet Caroline. We don't get any words from her. She is in a scene at some point, but we never see her face, nor does she ever get any lines. So this whole love arc made me very angry. It wasn't great. The prince does go like, I must be very dense, which again, I thought was very charming. We cut to the next scene, which is the king and the ministers having a meeting. And they're looking at a big map, trying to figure out essentially where they are on the map. At one point, the minister of the Navy goes, I've always interpreted the brown parts for the land and the blue parts for the sea, which that line made me really happy. When explained who this person is, the king is then surprised that they have a Navy. Yes. We find out that while he is indeed Minister of the Navy, the Navy consists of that fancy barge on the river. This is to inform the audience that they are quite small compared to neighboring countries and that they need a plan for something. The plan appears to be if there's strife or war or something, but we haven't established that anything's happening. So they just need a plan for the joy of having a plan. They're planning out alliances. They're still looking like who it would be best to have the prince betrothed to. They haven't given up on this idea. And they're trying to see like, oh, well, this country is good because they're strong here. And this country might be good because they're like rich in agriculture and stuff like that. And the king that informs us that he was married off before he was 14. This is the 1780s. That's not unreasonable. The Lord Chamberlain suggests that they have a massive ball where they will invite every eligible princess in Europe and beyond. The king then says, make sure she has teeth. He, the prince, has an obsession with teeth. Because one of the prince's complaints about Princess Selina was that she didn't have teeth. And 
the king is really confused about this and that will also be a running joke which i did find funny (laughs) the bright side of this plan is that if all of the countries are guests at the ball then they can't fight during the ball because that would be rude and you know what that prompts guys another song protocolically correct protocolically it's protocolically correct and it is why are you just saying that like it's easy I did a lot of musical theater in high school. Okay, that's fair. So the song is all about rules and regulations, and they have all of the members of the cabinet or whatever pretend to be the various different princesses that they're going to invite, and they mock up a table of who's going to sit where so as not to insult somebody else. And then protocol, protocol, above all, above all, above all. And it's the longest song in the world is my only note about it. So here's what my experience was. At this point, I had to go to the bathroom. I left the movie. And I was betting that when I came back, the song would still be happening. And guess what, guys? It was still happening. There was an entire bathroom break in this song, which frankly, I appreciated. Actually, the protocolically correct song does have a really cute ending where they all end sitting next to one another. And then at the very last second, I'll jump up and switch seats. And it was actually kind of a cute ending to that song. So now we go back to Cinderella. She's in front of a big tub of apples and someone is knocking on the door. So Cinderella opens the door and it's a lady and she's dressed like a little shabbily with like a kerchief over her head. And she goes, well, now, were you expecting me? And Cinderella says, no. Okay, look, it's the fairy godmother. It's the fairy godmother. She's got the gray hair. She's kind of slightly silvery. She's magic. And she asks, could I come in and rest by your fire? And Cinderella says, I'm not supposed to let anyone in. But yes, of course you can come in. I don't have a lot, but what's mine is yours. But also, please don't stay too long. Also, I have to keep working because I have a bunch of stuff to do. Yes. The fairy godmother sits by the fire, looks at it. It's a very small fire, so she looks at it, like, magically, and it becomes bigger. They just have sort of random conversation about traveling or staying home comfortably. It's very inane conversation. And at one point, the fairy godmother goes, well, doesn't your dog keep you company? And Cinderella responds with, I don't have a dog. And the fairy godmother goes, well, who's that? And we look, and there's a little doggy. And it's so cute. cute. It looks sort of like a Yorkie. So it's brown and black and kind of curly and a smallish medium dog. It's just really cute, guys. At this point, I was ready to give this movie an A plus potentially because this is the first time I've seen a Cinderella movie in which is part of solving Cinderella's problems. The fairy godmother gives her a dog. Oh, yeah. I was excited. And I was like, this is A plus material. I am open to it. Let's Uh, see where this goes. Uh, yeah. It did not It did not go up. It went nowhere. The fairy godmother says, you should keep him. He'll be good. And he'll take care of himself. He'll take care of himself. The stepmother starts hollering for Cinderella off screen. And the fairy godmother says, well, I've seen everything I want to see and leaves. And the stepmother, continuing to holler, enters the room and comes down the stairs and leaves blow in her face. And everything is done. The potatoes are peeled and the apples are sliced and the peas are organized and the carrots are, this table is just full of prepared foods the stepmother is very impressed but what she says is i see i will have to give you more work to do next time and the dog successfully stays hidden because part of the thing is that cinderella must hide this dog from her stepmother obviously mm-hmm. we cut to the castle now because we're, we're just done with that scene we're done with that scene and next the prince is talking to his father and the king is like i've decreed it and the prince is like then you must undecree it undecree it i he's refusing to go this is all about the ball by the way yes the king and Um, queen and prince are arguing the prince is refusing to go to this ball the ministers are all listening in at the keyhole very in a very childlike fashion And the prince's complaints are what everybody's complaints are about the promise of having a ball with all the eligible young ladies there so the prince can pick a bride. It's like some sort of beauty contest with me as the prize. It's utterly repulsive, degrading to all concern. 
And he's like, it's the meat market and it's gross and yucky and I don't want to do it. So at this point, the prince is back in my good books. I like that he knows that this is a terrible idea and that it is degrading to everybody involved. And he compares it to a cattle show. But then we get another song. This is five songs now. Just I felt the need to count everyone and I regret that decision. This is also where we get yet another appearance from the terrible cousin. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh my who goodness. also sings he does he's really excited and i did not write down any exact lines but basically he goes "Ooh, ooh can i come there will be nubile delicacies and i shall wear high heels to add to my stature oh he says a lot of gross things he's like i'm not too prideful to pick up your leftovers you know oh, you're gonna pick the pick girl first and, and I'll... I'll unleash myself on the rest it's so Ugh. so here's the thing High heel shoes were genuinely invented in the 1600s for dudes. They were made for dudes so that dudes could look taller and fancier. So high heels are originally dude things. So as a historian, I found that quite funny. Um, Yes, I thought it was funny, but it kept adding and adding to the queer coding. And then suddenly he was declaring that he's going to find a lady. And he was saying that he's desperate to find the lady. And he was very like, sexually charged when he was talking about it and it was gross and weird it was it was gross and weird um and confusing for me if also for me because at that point i started to question did the movie know that they have a gay character we we have no idea the bride finding ball song blessedly ends the lord chamberlain comes in to declare that there is now a threat of war because the prince did not propose to selena the princess of wherever i didn't catch it and the king gives this advice to the prince. Just do what I did when I married your mother. I closed my eyes and thought of Euphrania. And that I really loved because that is normally a woman line. Normally that is an advice that women would give their daughters on the mm-hmm. wedding night because you couldn't just teach women about sex or anything or prepare them in any useful way. And I love that the king said it about himself. I thought that was delightful. I like that a lot. I, I like the whole focus on the prince not wanting to marry. Because that is like a very princess storyline where she wants to marry for love, not for political alliances. Yeah. And the fact that we get to see so much of his like internal emotions and how he doesn't want to be paraded out in front of all these princesses. And how he feels like very vulnerable. Yeah. I thought that was a very nice touch. It was a nice angle and I did like it. So we then see the prince posing in front of essentially a cardboard cutout with his face just stuck through it. Like you do at fairs where you Mm -hmm. you take a picture and everybody's painting his portrait. It's a cardboard cutout of him, by the way, just in a better outfit. Yeah. And his face, he's just got his head stuck through there. And this is so that many portraits of him can rapidly be painted and sent off with couriers to everywhere to invite everyone to the ball. And so we get a montage of couriers arriving somewhere, showing someone this picture and various responses. One of the responses, courier shows up at a nice croquet yard, shows this portrait to the princess and she faints. The then we hear is... some bagpipes. Yep, so we go to Scotland and he shows the portrait to someone and gets shoved in the moat. Another one holds it up while standing on a different moat and just gets shot by an arrow. Shot through the heart, dies instantly. Oh yeah, no, he's not coming back. He's, he's like, dead. He's dead. We cut back to the king and the cham- Lord Chamberlain is talking to him about how this courier thing is going and reports that of the invitations that have been sent out, six have said yes, five refused, one extremely obscenely. I want to think those are the Scots. Two of the invitees are dead and the remaining three could not be found. They've got six out of 16, which the king says is not a bad average. When inviting people to parties, given how people don't show up, it's actually not bad. Uh, But he decides to invite the local nobility so that the party can be fully fleshed out and it doesn't feel, you know, sparse. He also decides that they're going to raise taxes to pay for it. What is the tax on, Talon? Can you tell us what the tax is going to be on? Oh, it's on snobbery and everyone's going to be paying it. Yep. 
the Lord Chamberlain gets very excited about it and just is a little bit too brown nosery. Mm -hmm. And the king goes, don't overdo it. You'll be paying it too. It was great. I got to say, of all the characters, I was most curious about the king because he just delivered a lot of extremely interesting lines that I wanted to talk to him about. He seemed like he had like a large interior life. The father, by the way, I don't know if anybody is familiar with the 1967 Taming of the Shrew with Liz Taylor and Richard Burton. He plays the father in in that. So that's where I knew him from. So I was just imagining him being browbeaten by a young Elizabeth Taylor the entire time. That was more fun than this movie. So I <laughs> I went to my happy place. So uh, we cut to the stepsisters. Cinderella is washing the stairs. And meanwhile, they receive the invitation from His Royal Highness the Prince. And they start talking about what can we wear? What, what can we do? How can we get ready? And the two stepsisters start figuring like, oh, you should wear brown. Oh, you spiteful creature. Oh, mama. Yes. We find out at this point that the stepsisters have names. Their names are Isabella and Palatine, which, sure. It's not important. It doesn't matter, but it is nice that they get names. The stepmother tells Cinderella that the water she's washing the staircase with is dirty and she must rewash the entire thing. Cinderella started out like very assertive and Mm. she's completely brown beaten after that first scene. She always acquiesces and she's very quiet. Yeah, it was upsetting. I wanted, um, I wanted some sass. I was so hopeful at the way it started out. The longer this movie went on, just the worst it got. Yeah, yeah. So we go back to the prince now because nothing important is happening in that scene. And he's getting fitted for new clothes and he's annoyed with having clothes tailored to him and starts complaining to John, who still can't dance with Lady Caroline. And now we're done with that scene because this movie just doesn't know what it's doing it doesn't know what story it's on it doesn't know how to focus so next we get a scene of the stepmother and the stepsisters arriving in a carriage at the dress store to buy dresses but they're sold out because everybody wants a new dress for the ball and duh yes basically she's unable to process this information but she decides that they have to be completely utterly splendid And what she decides to do is to give Cinderella a bunch of dresses that don't work and demand that she make out of them three new dresses that do work. I don't understand why they would trust Cinderella to do this. As far as we know, she's never sewed a dress before. Yeah. Dressmaking is difficult work and it is time consuming. So that's a bizarre ask for someone who has not been a servant and 100% isn't a dressmaker. So... We see Cinderella sewing by the fireplace and then we hear a bell ring and the door opens slightly and the dog runs out and we cut to the fairy godmother who's writing a romance novel. Possibly an erotic romance novel. Possibly. It is A Thousand and One Arabian Nights because it turns out that she is the fairy godmother to everybody. She has two chickens named Hansel and Gretel. Do you think those are the- Two pigeons. Do you think those are the real Hansel and Gretel? Do you think they got turned into pigeons? I think so, because she feeds them breadcrumbs. Yeah. I was very concerned. Me too. So the dog comes in and the fairy godmother scolds him for not wiping his paws. And she complains about how busy she is. She's got a little mermaid on Wednesday and the ugly duckling is there to be born on Friday. And she's having a new key made for Pandora's box. And we find out that she can only do magic for other people. So she turns something into a bone for the dog. And then she has a hilarious little conversation with herself where she asks herself if she would like a cup of tea. And she tries to magic tea for herself and the kettle explodes and falls into the fireplace. And finally, she asks the dog why it's there, what's going on with Cinderella. And we go back to Cinderella. So like, why did we have that scene? Why was that there? It was trying very hard to be fun and kooky, and I just didn't. Enjoy it was it. fun and kooky, but it just didn't go anywhere. 
I think it was supposed to like dazzle us with how different she is from her first appearance because when she first appeared she was more shabbily dressed and now she's fancier and there's all these things that are like in her home and she's writing with this big book and I think we were supposed to be razzle dazzled all right so Cinderella is working on the dresses it's going very poorly something rips she puts her head down and then all of a sudden the fairy godmother is there the door blows open with the wind and Cinderella looks up and there's no one there and then we pan behind her and the fairy godmother is just sitting there and Cinderella goes how funny I was just wishing and the fairy godmother is like yeah that's that's why I'm there and then she asks do you mind if I make a very rude comment and Cinderella agrees and the fairy godmother (laughs) declares that the dresses are hopeless Cinderella goes they are worse than hopeless I've ruined them the fairy godmother then gets Cinderella something to eat and it's another one of those where Cinderella looks in one direction and then when she looks back a plate has appeared and the fairy godmother is like oh it's my own recipe and Cinderella says she doesn't understand and the fairy godmother responds with you're not supposed to understand you're just supposed to accept and be gracious which okay She then goes on this long rant about how she lacks tact, but you shouldn't judge people by appearances. And she goes on this weird tirade about the human condition and a whole rant about how mad she is about glitter. She just gets on a whole thing about glitter. Well, she says that she's not what she seems because if she had showed up looking all sparkly and glittery and just absurd, uh, which is the most unsuitable costume for a grown woman, she wouldn't be able to sort out the worthy from the unworthy. And she explains that she's a fairy godmother and please don't ask how she got into it. Cinderella's passed the test. She's convinced that Cinderella is a good person. She didn't bother trying with the, the, step-sisters. Step, the stepmother and the stepsister. She's like, okay, well, that's not going to work not out. Not even going to bother. And she basically sends Cinderella off to eat and rest and makes everything happen. She asks herself, what are they wearing in Paris nowadays and starts magicking dresses and they're kind of beautiful but also very highlighter colored yeah the colors are peach lavender and lime green yes so I want to talk about this trope for just a second because I really like it it is an old fairy tale thing of someone is nice to someone unexpectedly someone is nice to the poor beggar one by the road to the old man who's wandering the forest someone shares their lunch with someone scary someone is releases a deer from a trap and that winds up being the king of the deer the magic witch the rescued prince it just winds up being someone special so i really liked that that got included it was really nice that there was a reason that Cinderella has a fairy godmother, that there's not enough of them to go around, as we find out, but that she passed the test by being very kind, even though she wasn't really supposed to let anybody in, and she shared her meal, and I thought that was a really nice tie-in with a lot of older fairy tales, and I liked that. I did too. I really, really liked that. I also like that the whole narrative structure of Cinderella is assigned tasks and she tries to do them and she does her best and because she's trying to do them herself somebody comes in and helps her mm-hmm. and she falls asleep and she wakes up and everything's done and it's perfect yeah because she's kind yeah I also like that included in the Cinderella story but here's the thing the task is normally grain related it's normally sorting grains and rice and lentils and peas it's something else. It's not normally make three lovely gowns for your horrifically abusive step family. Because what the fairy godmother does is make three beautiful gowns for her incredibly abusive step family, which just she is helping Cinderella with a task, admittedly, and she is saving Cinderella from punishment. Yes, but it just I didn't like it. I was not a fan of it. Usually when there's a scene in which Cinderella must make dresses. It's to showcase how talented she is. Yes. And this didn't do that. And it also didn't accomplish having something nice happen for her because ultimately this was something nice for the step family. So yeah, I agree with everything you said. And on top of that, it didn't help build Cinderella's characterization. It did not. So the stepmother tells Cinderella that she has done a tolerable job, commands her to 
clean the stepmother's bedroom before they return from the ball and then they leave for the ball. Cinderella wishes them a nice time oh, and man. the stepmother res- responds with, you may depend on that. But angry. Yeah. But said angrily and sort of in a yelly tone and it was so mean. Yeah. Normally when we get a Cinderella wishing her step family to have a good time we're answered by an echoing silence we're answered by nothing because they've already left it was very bizarre yeah after they all leave Cinderella holds up one of the discarded dresses to herself in the mirror and like sways back and forth with it and you can tell that she's really dreaming about going to the ball as well but we hard cut to the palace as the step family arrives and we see an announcer announcing fancy people I have lots of fancy skipping. They're doing some sort of gallop dance and it's uh, weird. And And then then we cut again instantly. Back to Cinderella. So then it's a shot of the fairy godmother standing outside and she's basically like at a crossroads literally and metaphysically. Yeah. And she goes, oh, why not? I'll just make time. And she appears to Cinderella and goes, yes, just as I thought, sitting all alone, feeling sorry for ourselves, which is understandable in the situation. Yes. And Cinderella says that she wasn't wishing for anything. She was just sort of thinking about what it would be like to go to the ball. And the fairy godmother is like, you want to go in your heart of hearts. You want to go. And so you will. Also, the fairy godmother cannot speak without complaining about how much work she does. Yes, she's a very busy woman and she hasn't got all day. (laughs) How dare you? So the fairy godmother's powers are not unlimited. uh, And she says, you know, and Cinderella goes, I didn't know. And she has to share them out. So she borrows some until midnight and she kind of gestures at a pumpkin and tells it to go outside and it disappears in some glitter and she sends the dog off too. And along with the mice and she tells the dog to round up a frog or a lizard and I thought this was going to be one in our lizard column but it's actually a frog this time which is is. weirder somehow for me yeah so now I gotta add a whole other list to my excel spreadsheet Ugh. so the fairy godmother pulls out a mannequin and is looking at it and is like okay this doesn't always work uh but I am always lucky so let's see and she does magic and we pan to the mannequin and it's got a knight's outfit on and the music is very, very silly. Yeah, we get womp womp music. We get womp womp. Yes. <laughs> but then, as we've done several times before, we pan back to Cinderella. And she's wearing laughing. this gorgeous pink gown. It's really pretty. And the fairy godmother goes, oh, yes, most unsuitable for a ball. You'll just have to go as you are. And Cinderella's like, oh, and she realizes that she's wearing this beautiful gown. And it's a very fun magic trick and I really liked it. I thought it was a cute way to tease Cinderella and kind of cheer her up. It was. But then we get another song. It's a song about dreams coming true. Which starts with this great moment, which I did love, where Cinderella goes, how do you do it? And the fairy godmother goes, well, it's a trade secret, which it's cute I like that but then she ruins it by saying but it helps if you dream yeah so we get this dreaming magic something song whatever during which she spins the broom of a whole bunch and it turns the top of the broom into a white Marie Antoinette wig for Cinderella yes and then we get the shoes I think this is my favorite shoe thing that I've ever That's seen because in- she bakes them she does so what happens is she picks up an empty pitcher, pours more water out of it than could possibly be in it into a bunt cake pan. I want to be, it's shaped, it, it's a bunt cake. So it's a big donut cake with a hole in the middle and it's shaped like a flower because those cakes are really fun. She puts a plate on top of it and turns it upside down, which is how you get a cake out of a bunt pan. But then it catches on fire fire shoots out of the middle of it she lifts the bunt pan off of the plate and lo and behold there are shoes so these were water bunt cake rose fire shoes that are now glass and I am never going to be okay again they're so glittery there is a lot of glitter going everywhere while this was happening and the shoes are so sparkly 
And I wouldn't like describe them as glass slippers exactly. They look more silver to me, they but do, they're yeah. stunning. They're the monkey part of my brain that sees something shiny and is like, I want it, shiny. put it in my mouth. Yeah. That they got were, activated. Yeah, they were I think they were my favorite glass slippers so far that we've ever encountered. Just I in do terms like of them a lot. How amazing they were and how hilariously they were created. They're they're way over the top like everything else is in this movie. And I really appreciate it. So if you're going to have glass slippers, please have fun with that. Mm-hmm. So then she hands it to Cinderella. Cinderella opens it, but they're gone. And then she looks kind of confused, but it's the same trick again. They're already on her feet. Yeah, we, we do that a lot because this movie doesn't have a ton to offer. So we just, we hit that note again and again and again and again. Until every last drop of enjoyment has been wrung out from it and you're just left with like a bad aftertaste. So Cinderella says that she doesn't know how to act and fairy godmother tells her basically act like yourself. You are a princess. You are the princess incognita. Again, we get another princess incognita. Yeah. Is that like a thing? I don't know. I haven't run across that in fairy tales, but this is the second time we've gotten a princess of incognita. And do people not know what incognito means? Like, is that the joke? I don't know. Or was that not common before she used it? I don't know. I want to know how many, I'm going to start, I'm going to add another list to my Excel spreadsheet. Guys, my Excel spreadsheet for Cinderella's is getting alarmingly large. I just, I've reached the end of the alphabet. I'm into the double letters now, just to let you know what's happening with the spreadsheet. Then bad things happen. Terrible things happen next. Um, Do you want to draw straws to see who doesn't have to talk about this? Oh, I'll do it. I'll talk about this. Okay, good. Because my notes aren't happy. What do your notes say? So the pumpkin turns into a beautiful carriage. It's beautiful. It's got like filigree on it. It's sparkly. It's everything you could ever want. But then we have dancing mice men. Horrible, horrible dancing mice men. What this is, is male ballet dancers in just regular people outfits with disturbingly realistic mouse heads on top of their heads. And they're so articulated and they look like they have fur and their beady little red eyes and they're just dancing and it's terrible and they're and then, they're they're filmed as though they're small by the way they're filmed in a small way so yes so they're filmed in like a fake version of the room in which they're proportionally mouse sized and then we kind of zoom in on their red eyes and then we zoom out and they're no. big white horses no no i'm so sorry that is not what happens so we get ballet of them as tiny mice and then as they go outside they are still wearing their mice heads, but they are now proportionally human sized. I didn't notice that. And then I didn't they want go, to notice that. Too bad. I'm not doing this alone. They go over to the carriage in their mice heads and they bend over so that they are on all oh fours. Oh God, I forgot. I forgot the way they crouch down. Yeah, they crouch down doing essentially a very weird downward dog position. And we zoom in on their horrible little beady eyes and we zoom out and it's four horses now. And I don't want to say that mice have horrible little beady eyes because mice are cute and sweet pets. But these specific fake mice had horrible beady little eyes. So here's the thing. I have seen people do ballets where mice are involved, specifically the Nutcracker, where there have been mice and rat-headed ballet dancers. And it can be done beautifully. It can be done. It it's can. always horrified me. No, it can be done so well. I promise it can. Or at least it was once. I've seen it done well, exquisitely well, once. Okay. But this was not that. And I thought, oh, we're safe. The mice have been turned into horses. We're done now. The horses now. are real horses. The too. horses are real horses. They're not ballet dancers and horses' heads for which, thank you, Jesus. Eternally grateful. But we're not done because there's a frog there's a horrible frog man yeah it's It's the same thing it's the same thing it's a ballet dancer now in green with a giant frog head just doing weird frog hoppy on all four things and then on a giant on a giant lily pad so we get the sense that he is frog sized and then he jumps up out of the water and 
now he's a regular human man on the bridge still doing like frog hops but in human outfit now it was horrific so bad it was so upsetting i think this was a real turning point in the movie yeah yeah we didn't really know it but this was where we started to really not well, have because a good time this was the point where we were like this should be almost over why is there still like 45 minutes left oh sorry no why is there still an hour and 10 minutes left is what Dear happens. god this is this is oh my god because the ball was with at the hour and 10 minute mark and this movie was two hours and 20 minutes long so this is we're not even at halfway and we're already at the coach scene so so yeah this was the first really big red flag that we missed that we just breezed on by we should have known we should have known there was horrible mice men so the fairy godmother reminds cinderella that again she has to return the magic by midnight or everything she's changed will turn back and cinderella sings a reprise of the magic whatever dream song so we cut to the ball and in a fun moment for me (laughs) i wrote okay so they're basically doing a polonaise or a minuet-esque dance and then the dance ends and there's a throwaway line by somebody who goes i love the polonaise and i went i'm such a nerd (laughs) i just wrote that everyone's wearing pastel colors they are um, and that there's couples dancing in lines they are they're doing a stately couples dance done with other couples in long lines that is done with grace but not to sad music it's a polonaise i don't know how else to describe it we see foreign princesses and they're trying to make them look foreign so they're giving them different headdresses that look slightly weird and then Um, the grandmother requests that john take her to the dance floor yeah we haven't really talked about the queen mother but the queen mother is in this in basically every scene and she is aggressively senile she has no idea what's going on at any time she's, she's also loud. hard of hearing yep she's loud and brazen in her opinions and she's frankly a delight and a treasure and one of the high points of this movie yes i i wrote down some of her lines they're they're usually one-liners um yes. or just observations that are completely off the mark but somehow relevant to what's happening yes she was a joy i i loved her so cinderella arrives now i have a note about how pretty the carriage is it's really ornate there's fancy carved leaves everywhere and padded brocade interior that's all shiny and satiny i don't know I, i thought it was gorgeous and we watch cinderella walk up 17 flights of stairs it's a lot of flights of stairs meanwhile the prince is chatting to a girl in yellow and the king from behind her stage whispers to the prince that she has excellent teeth and kind of like points at his teeth to make sure that the prince really gets it. I think the teeth joke might be the only running gag that continues to work in this. <laughs> I don't know why. They managed to get that one correct. The party is now doing a quadrille, but dumbly. So it's, a, it's more of a bouncy dance with couples, but they're doing it kind of stupidly. The dance ends, and the announcer announces grandly, the princess incognita. And everyone murmurs confusedly because no one knows about this princess. Mm -hmm. She enters to complete silence. Our prince is literally slack-jawed, mouth open, just... And everyone else backs away, clearing a massive path for him. So then Cinderella and the prince's eyes meet and they walk very slowly towards each other, very slowly, making a lot of eye contact. In absolute silence. And they just stare at each other for a while without blinking. And then she curtsies and he makes sort of a rise motion, but he makes it with his hand with no noise over her head where she couldn't see. So, I mean, whatever. It looked interesting. So they start dancing and they're just doing very weird proto-English dancing. So they're doing siding, which is shoulder to shoulder, and they're doing other siding, which is where you go around one another by the shoulder and then back. And they're doing something that's called up a double and back, where you 
hold hands and walk forward two steps and pause and then back two steps and pause and they're doing one hand around circles it's it's bizarre it's a bizarre weird dance and then it transitions into a waltz Mm -hmm. somehow it's kind of meh I didn't like it it was a boring waltz and it irritated me a bunch of other couples join them on the dance floor and while the prince and cinderella sort of sway in the middle they make these like different shapes around them and I thought it was very beautiful that all of the dresses and the men's outfits as well, they were on this beautiful gradient from pink to green. And several times they lined up in the circle where it faded seamlessly from pink to green. And it was like perfectly arranged. And I thought visually that was very pleasing. I did love the colors in this. My issue Mm -hmm. with this is that Cinderella's dress was not different enough. So if you're going to have a color-coded party, the way the Rogers and Hammer, the way the Brandy Cinderella is, where the party mm-hmm. is, everybody is in teals and blues. Her dress has to stand out, but still match. Her dress mm-hmm. was just a pale pink. And there were several other people wearing identical wigs with a pale pink dress. And so she did not visually stand out. And I didn't like that. Her dress was pretty, but just... Uh, they did the color scheme not quite right. I don't know how else to describe it. I thought it was close because her dress was paler than everybody else's, even though there were other people wearing pink dresses there. And I thought that her whole look was more put together than other people's, where they purposefully made the the stepsister's hair like look different and to our like modern eye like sillier. Where yes. it's like frizzier or pointier or something. Yeah, they, they did make an effort to make the stepsisters look very different, which was fine. But I, I, I still had a hard time with everybody in wigs um, and wearing pale makeup. I was like, this could be anyone. <laughs> it was really hard. She just wasn't visually different enough. She, she matched too well. I thought she looked very lovely. And with the way that her arrival was announced and the prince looking directly at her, like... I was sold. I did believe that everyone stopped and looked at her. And I did believe that the prince looked across the room and saw her. Yes, I did. It was just that once everyone stopped looking and the dancing commenced, I couldn't pick her out. That's fair. I could pick out the prince because he was wearing a darker green than everybody else, but I couldn't pick her out. She should have been wearing white or red or something really distinctly at the other end of the spectrum Mm -hmm. or have... I don't know, blue embroideries or something, something that made her dress distinctly different. And she just didn't. And it was just a little thing, but it really irritated me because they clearly were trying to do that. Mm-hmm. By the way, they could have even tinted her wig like a, to the other end of the spectrum of like pink to blue. Yeah, you know? that, that would have been visually interesting because they had tinted wigs back then. That was a thing. Yeah. You, would, you would tint your wig. That was, that was cool. It was a hip thing to do back in the 17 whatevers. So here's the thing with the dancing now that really irritated me. Everyone around them is doing a mazurka, Mm -hmm. but they're slow dancing in the middle. They're just sixth grade, make room for Jesus, slow dancing from foot to foot. Okay, so the way that you make a historical movie with a dance scene is that rather than training actors to dance, which you can't do, you just hire a troupe of dancers. And you put them in costumes and you say, come in and dance and we'll put two of our actors in there with you so it looks like actors are dancing when it's not. It's just people who know how to do this and are a troupe and they're dancing. So those people knew how to dance. They were a dance troupe who knew how to dance and they were doing a good job and we weren't focused on it and it made me really angry. Oh, I'm so sorry. It's okay. I'm going to go watch something else that has vintage dancing and it done really well after this. And then I'll be happy again. Pout. I'm pouting a lot over here. So the dancing ends and we move out to the garden with the prince and Cinderella. And they're having conversation where she says, oh, I should explain why I'm here. And he goes, no, let me explain. And he explains that he's been trapped by his birthright and that marriage should begin with love. And this is an upsetting ball and I'm apologize for everything which is to be fair pretty reasonable he then says a really weird line he goes i think marriage should begin with love don't you and cinderella goes i've never really thought about it which was weird okay so what's happening is he believes that she received a portrait of him 
and an explanation of what this is and then chose to come based on that. She doesn't know that all these invitations went out to the princesses to be like, would you marry this dude? So he thinks that she's here for marrying him and she has literally never thought about marriage before. Yep. He responds with, okay, well then seriously, I didn't write any of the lines down, but he essentially says, seriously, why did you respond to such a weird invitation? Oh, I have every line. Of course you do. (laughs) I'm amazed you even accepted the invitation to the ball. Didn't you think it odd? And she's like, oh, I thought it was a little odd. And he's like, but you still came? Why? And she's like, oh, must you ask that? And he's like, yes, I must. And she says, I had heard much of you. And he goes, oh, good or bad. And she says, no, nothing but good. The prince then says something like, I will I always, always remem- remember this moment. You must take my present happiness to make you happy. Did I get that line right? Yeah. And yeah. then he says, I give it to you with all my heart. What does that mean? I have no idea. You must take my present happiness to make you happy. What could that possibly mean? I'm happy, therefore you must be happy? It is completely baffling. But he said it like so romantically and intensely that it kind of worked for me. I was okay until the next second when we get another song, at which point my notes go, please let me die. This is a terrible song and it unfortunately comes back, but it's all about how there's a kingdom, just the two of them, and the king is love and love alone. It's a real 70s song. That's a real, real 1970s free love song. And looking at it through that lens, it made me laugh. (laughs) And it's all about how, like, they're all alone together in their secret kingdom. And love is like monarchy in some way. And monarchy is good. And Cinderella sings with him. And one of her lines is, would you be content with only me? Which adds to my, she's asking about the free love movement. She's, this is, this is 100% a hippie thing. And oh, I read it as like, oh, with little old me, would you would be content with me the way I am? Oh, that's how it was meant. I oh, just okay. decided to interpret it differently because I was bored. By the way, everybody, I want you to know, these songs were terrible and I just kept putting Rodgers and Hammerstein songs over them in my head. So I'm listening to this very banal. Love is a secret kingdom where the princes love. That, that, and in my head and in my room where I watch this I'm out loud singing 10 minutes ago I met you because it's just better songs and it's the exact same thing so I'm aggressively trying to overwrite this music it sounds a little bit like the in my own little corner song by the way it has a couple you said that about every song so it does it does it starts with da 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 and then it goes somewhere else because they can only do one song and in my own little corner has an accidental in the 70s would have just absolutely had an aneurysm if they knew what that was so so anyway there's a big music swell they're holding hands the prince cups cinderella's face and he kisses her it's a really romantic kiss i was annoyed but the kiss was really romantic i liked it a lot it was a very romantic kiss we also got three notes where they sang in harmony instead of in unison it is the only three notes where there will be harmony in this entire godforsaken <laughs> thing. So I just wanted to mention that if you were looking for harmony, it's this scene. You get three notes. That's what you get. So the Lord Chamberlain then interrupts with him to say that the king wants an audience with the princess incognito. And while the prince is answering him, the clock strikes midnight and Cinderella flees. To which the prince responds, you frightened her. So the scene was so beautiful. She's going down a million steps and there's moonlight and her dress is tinted a little purpley and there's all this lavender flowers and all these flower petals start falling down around her and mm-hmm. she's running and everything's blue and purple and it was beautiful. It was lovely. And these stairs are sort of zigzag stairs so as she rounds one of the corners she's suddenly back in her old clothes yes and she continues to run down all 17 flights of steps she and leaves she gets, behind a shoe she does i know you're and, all surprised yep and the prince eventually gets to the bottom of the stairs 
and sees her shoe and yells, wait, come back to literally no one because there's no one there. And he picks up the shoe and whispers, come back. In and his defense, it's very dark. Okay, so I got to know if what happened happened to you as well. The movie is now pitch black. Yes. Okay, good. I think that what's happening in the scene is they wanted to let us know that it was nighttime. And so Cinderella is running home. I think she's hiding behind a tree. She she's is, She's singing yes. another horrific song. But the screen is 90% black. And there's a very deep blue filter over everything. So... Yeah, it's nighttime. It's it's nighttime in the sense that there's no light. You guess what's going on. Well, listen, with the intensity that they wanted us to know that it was snowing, that there was snow on the ground, <laughs> That's they bring that same intensity to letting us know that it is nighttime now and it's dark out. So this is the song she sings, and it is god-awful. Uh, Cinderella is smiling and she's going rainbows raced around the room when he danced with me and they really lean into that line because the prince sings the same thing later on Mm -hmm. but essentially Cinderella's song is that last night was only a fantasy and I know that this is all I get and this is all that it will ever be but it's going to be in my heart forever yeah and so the music continues but we cut to the prince in an empty ballroom that is almost as dark as the outside night he puts the shoe on the floor and then sings to it and pretends to dance with it which was not a scene i was expecting i was not expecting prince dances alone with Anne shoe in an empty ballroom at midnight that was it's weird. very impressive how quickly they cleared out that ballroom after cinderella left yeah there's also a beautiful chandelier there and it was very sparkly And the embroidery on the prince's coat is also very sparkly. Mm -hmm. It was just a very sparkly scene with the sparkling shoe in the middle. We haven't really talked about it, but the sets in this movie are excellent. They're all very rich and very lush. They do not feel that weird 70s cardboard cutout thing where you can tell that you're on a set. It felt very lavish, like you were in an actual castle. Mm -hmm. And so I really enjoyed the visuals of this. Mm Mm-hmm. I liked the looking at it part. Yes. I didn't like the experience, but I liked the looking at it part. It was very beautiful. The The costuming was gorgeous. It and was. the lighting was very nice. And wanted, yeah. the content was not good. No, but Cinderella also, we haven't talked about it, but she has a beautiful voice. We've we've seen some Cinderella's where the voice was unfortunately suboptimal. But she's a beautiful voice. It's mellow. It's low. It's very sweet. She has a beautiful tone, timber. It's it's gorgeous. She has a beautiful singing voice. Every time she's singing, the songs are terrible, but her voice is not contributing to the problem. So I appreciated that. So in his version of the song, the, the prince asks, could it be the tonight is all it'll ever be? And he's pining very hard. Mm-hmm. Cinderella, meanwhile, is doing chores. Yeah, so it's it's morning now. We cut to morning, and Cinderella is now in a very pretty kind of floral dress, which I guess is still supposed to be a servant dress, but it's it's white with it's a very light nice. floral pattern. It's really cute. And the stepmother is calling for her, and she wants a weak infusion of tea for her headache. By the way, another running gag in this movie is that the stepmother will routinely scream Cinderella. Cinderella will come running. And the stepmother will go, why do you not come when I call? Which is not as funny as the teeth running bit, but is still kind of funny. It was, it was fine. It landed fine. It's fine. Yeah. The stepsisters come in. They're all hungover, essentially. They're all kind of crying too. Yeah. But they're also really happy that they were in the palace. I don't know. They're having a whole bunch of really, really confusing emotions. So the stepmother says that the the two stepsisters were a triumph, and if it had been for that mysterious princess, the prince would have surely made his choice between my two angels. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Cinderella goes, oh, what princess? Because she wants to hear about herself. Oh, yeah. And she's told that she was not that pretty, striking perhaps, and as the stepsister is saying this, she looks in a mirror, and the mirror cracks. With sort of a 
a tinkle in the air like the fairy godmother is perhaps involved in this so that was a weird moment that i did not understand it was i understood what they were trying to do but it made no sense in universe so i was confused well because they pan to cinderella right after it makes it look like cinderella is a witch yeah or matilda i don't know and so that same stepsister says i wonder what the prince is going to do today and we cut immediately to the prince saying i'll tell you what the prince is going to do today and it was great it was one of the best transitions that that i've ever seen i loved it so the prince announces to his father that he's sick and tired of being the village idiot and the father's like the king's like i'm glad you're standing up for yourself and the prince (laughs) goes you're the one that treats me like an idiot basically he's furious that he did everything his father said he played his part and then when he finally by like a miracle found a woman he was interested in she was frightened away and we find out that there is a search in progress and that they're they've sent out the police and the prince complains that the police could never find a haystack let alone a needle in a haystack that was a good line at this point the (sighs) prince says that the only thing he has is the shoe and the king points out that the shoe is very dainty And the prince looks at it like he's never seen it before. And he goes, it's unique. Whoever fits the slipper must fit the bill. And he looks so proud of himself. I'm telling you, he's a ditzy, pompous, like empty, airheaded prince. By the way, it's a normal size shoe, y'all. It's not especially small. It's just a regular shoe. Um, I mean, it's like thinner than you would expect. And that's about it. So the king then picks up the shoe and is making weird mumbly king stuff about taking the shoe to be tried on every notable stranger. But the king is getting uncomfortably aroused by this shoe. He goes, it's half the size of your mother's. And then he finally gives it to the chamberlain. He's like, you better take it with you. It's very disturbing. That was a really weird scene. Yeah, like why 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 did you need to put that in there? Why did you do that? why was that happening so we cut to the town crier making the announcement about this whole shoe thing we get a one person shoe montage one person tries on the yeah. shoe and then we go to the stepsisters and I was it doesn't so fit. disappointed i was so disappointed by this the quality yeah. of this montage for almost a two and a half hour movie they couldn't give us a shoe montage we got 11 different songs one of which i counted was seven minutes long we got a seven minute long song we couldn't get a montage of people trying on the shoe i'm furious about this there were two things that i wanted from this movie the first one was a montage introducing all the different princesses from the Mm -hmm. different lands Mm -hmm. and i wanted them to be named and i wanted them to come out and curtsy and i wanted to see all their different outfits and learn all their different names oh you wanted wanted that you wanted the princesses on parade song I wanted the princesses on parade. Yeah. I did not get that. I did not get that even a little bit. I got a couple of shots of some random princesses who weren't like named to me. Yeah. And then what I wanted, which I think was a very reasonable thing to want, was to have a shoe montage. Show me a shoe montage. A good shoe montage. It's the whole, that's the hook that this whole stupid story rests on is a shoe montage. And you didn't do that. And so I was angry about that. But that anger was dwarfed, was made minuscule by what happened next. So the stepsisters are trying on the shoe. It doesn't fit. The stepmother goes, push, push hard, and nothing. And then that's it. That's the end of that scene. And Cinderella doesn't show up. Nobody asks, have you got any other daughters? Nobody asks, like, oh, who's that servant girl? Nothing. Nothing happens. And we go back to the prince and he's like, haven't you found any sign of her at all? And he's looking gloomily out the window. And the whole time I'm like, where is Cinderella? She she was there. You went to her house. That's how this story goes. What are we doing? Where is the story going? Why is there still half an hour left? I don't know. I don't know. I was really mad about that. So I was I was intrigued. I was ready for something exciting to happen. And something exciting did happen because what the prince has decided to do with the glass slipper is to make a monument out of it. A monument uh, to his lost love. 
Yes. Can you please, um, please describe this monument, please? I'm begging you. Oh, so what he's done is he's put this glass slipper in a glass box and then placed it upon a pedestal in like the town square where people can come and look at it. It's at eye height though. It's at child eye height. So it is mm, four and a half feet off the ground. So we see a bunch of people looking at it. And then we hear the prince say three months, six days, 10 hours. That's how long it's been since I last saw her. What torture love is. And, and then, then he remembers oh, yeah. that, you know, John is a person with a life of his own. And he goes, oh, how selfish of me. Forgive me, John. Have you seen your lady Caroline? Why are we cutting back to this John Caroline? I hate it. So John says, yes, I see her infrequently. And then there is another godforsaken song. And guys, this is the song that this lasts the worst for song. seven minutes. I counted the minutes because I was hoping we would be done after two or three or four or five. So this is a song about knowing your place knowing your place it's the, this is the position song and my first hint that this song was going horribly wrong is that john is singing and he's singing about how cowherds and shepherdesses can get married and that's not an issue and then we see a cowherd and what's supposed to be a shepherdess although she's milking a cow no the the line is milkmaid milkmaid okay my brain blotted this out. My brain is really... Because I specifically wrote down that a milkmaid and a knight could never work out. Yes. So then we get them singing in very weird Yorkshire accents. And I didn't appreciate it. But then John continues to sing. And so, we... No, no. No. So they say that a milkmaid and a knight wouldn't work out. And then... <laughs> the farmer suddenly starts singing and he goes i agree and then the milkmaid goes so do i it's terrible. and then they kind of both stand up and they're like that's how it always will be that's how it always was that's how it is and how it how it was and how it always will be which is sort of how the song goes and i wasn't happy that they were singing because they are nobody nothing characters who were not there one second ago and i hated it and so we continue to talk about other inappropriate things about soldiers marrying their colonel's daughters. And then some random soldiers join the song because the movie didn't hate me enough. And they sing about knowing their place. And then we got a thing with like servants and there's like the upper deck servants, upper deck, the upstairs and downstairs servants. That's what yes. I'm trying to say. So and we, they're singing about knowing their place. Yeah. So what happens is we continue the song, but we cut to an interior scene where all the servants are sort of sitting at the table and in one another's laps and being sort of very casual, but they hear the prince and John arriving and they flee to their respective places so that when the prince and John comes in, everything looks very much as it was. And they continue to sing about appropriate places, at which point the, I don't know, head manservant also joins the song. Have we met this character before? No. Does this character have a name? No. Do we want him to sing? No, we don't. We don't, but he does. He does. He joins this song and explains to the prince and John that below stairs also has its hierarchy of servants. And he takes the prince and John below stairs for a dance number where all the servants then sing and dance and leap about and play frisbee with one another with golden platters and they dance on staircases and banisters and there are maids that flip their aprons and I literally I started to cry during this song because I wanted it to be over so badly I wanted it to be done I've never wanted a song to end this badly in my life I started trying to make deals with Satan. I started trying to summon the Goblin King to take this movie away from me. I, I was really upset about this, guys. My migraine came back. And I will say that this song definitely played a part in that. Yeah, I'm, I'm really sorry to hear that. Are you okay? No, I feel awful. But oh, no. it's fine. So the prince has a solution to his mandatory best friend's dilemma. Uh, since he has the title of the whatever, whoever, something David, he can make his friend a knight. So he gets John to kneel, dubs him a knight, done. And he's like, 
now you're not my personal companion at arms anymore and we won't be able to spend time together but now you can marry lady caroline and be happy but now he needs a new best friend servant so he picks somebody random it's basically a child ask what his name is the boy can't answer because of protocol reasons so the head man servant answers for him his name is willoughby the prince announces that willoughby will be his new best friend manservant bodyguard hands him his sword tells him to put it on he's putting it on wrong he has the head footman fix it for him the head footman is mad about this does this go anywhere no does it ever matter no he said that he's changed the fate of two people today because he's basically defied the song he's taken something that was never supposed to be and he made it happen and he can't do it for himself but he can do it for other people just like the fairy godmother bam connected two things in this movie for a narrative sequence so basically he ends the song and says john go and be happy be happy for both of us essentially and then he gets really angry and he shatters the glass box with a slipper and he takes it out and he goes back inside the castle and then he throws it outside again it doesn't break because it lands in grass and we all know that grass is the softest thing to land in and nothing thrown from a tower ever breaks when it lands in grass and cinderella's dog goes and gets it and sees it and i thought it brought it to her but clearly it does not um no it 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 finds cinderella and makes cinderella go to the glass slipper and at this point john and caroline are already having a picnic outside we're watching them through the grass like we're some very like we're creeps we're like we're creepers we're watching them through the grass by the way we assume this is caroline as i said before she doesn't get any lines and we never see her face and she's never introduced it's just that we know that this is john so now we assume this is caroline yeah i hated it so what cinderella does when she finds the shoe is she just basks in the delight of having it and she holds it up in the air and starts dancing around with it and just kind of spinning and looking at it glitter in the sun and she creates this beacon basically and john notices this and goes i must fetch the prince why why must you fetch the prince i'm so confused about why you must fetch the prince but because there's some random girl dancing with the glass shoe yeah but it's the same shoe that got thrown away that could be literally he doesn't know he doesn't know it got thrown away i i know so cinderella is holding the shoe up and the prince rides up out of nowhere in this yeah uh, time stops working like you think it will and everything just happens all at once and i spent the next several minutes going is this a dream sequence fantasy sequence or is this actually happening because everything has sort of a glowy extra bright lit shimmer around it the way that things do when you're filming a dream sequence but this is just the like aesthetic choice that we've made we've also made the aesthetic choice of the prince wearing a white shirt with a very deep v he's now wearing your quintessential pirate shirt it's got neck ruffles it's open to the waist it's very frilly in a very manly way i gotta say i like the shirt i thought this was the best yeah, it looked. was a good look it yeah. was if but it was you're just... gonna ride up on a horse to oh, yeah. greet the woman that you want to marry it's a that's good not a bad shirt to be yeah. wearing so he rides up and just out of literally out of nowhere he rides up out of nowhere jumps down from the horse kisses her and then leads her away okay he doesn't just kiss her like they full-on make out oh it's great it, it's a romantic scene which is why my notes are just is this happening is this a dream fantasy i don't know it it does turn out that this is all really happening but it took me a really long time to figure this out so cinderella walks into the manor and the stepmother immediately starts to scream at her but then sees that the prince is behind her and the prince is intimidating and so the stepmother curtsies and the stepsisters arrive also screaming but then also see the prince and curtsy and the prince says i hear that you are the guardian of my wife to be and the stepmother is staggered and says, I am I'm more than a guardian. I have been a mother to her. And then says, you know, come in, Cinderella. I was so worried about you. And the prince then says, no, I have important things to do and leaves with Cinderella. And Cinderella says, in my happiness, I forgive you. And they leave and the stepmother is furious. How dare she forgive me? Which is such a power move. To just look down your nose at someone and say, I forgive you. 
here's the thing. I thought this was going to go in so many directions so many times in this incredibly short scene. Yes. I thought the prince was going to see that the stepmother was awful and condemn her. That didn't happen. I thought the stepmother was going to say, I've been like a mother to her. And Cinderella would finally speak up and say, no, you've been absolutely abusive and awful and I hate you. But that doesn't happen. And then I thought the stepmother was going to say, oh, come in. And she was going to do something dastardly to swap one of her daughters with Cinderella. But that doesn't happen. And then I thought they were going to leave. And Cinderella forgives her. And I thought the stepmother then in her anger would do something that mattered later. But none of it goes anywhere that's just a weird scene that happens for no reason. Uh, and now we follow Cinderella and the prince to the king and queen where she introduces herself as Cinderella and a local and not a princess. So this is where the Cinderella story ends and we have started a new story with an entirely different tone. We sure have. And the funny, silly, magical tone is over. And now we're doing like real political dilemma things, I guess. Yes. We also then get a very weird line. The, uh, the queen mother is in this scene as she is in every scene with the king and queen. And she's very dotty and she's saying, you know, who is this? And the prince says, well, this is the woman that I'm going to marry. And the queen mother goes, well, she's most unsuitably dressed. And the prince goes, you're quite right, but I will fix that right away. And I was like, are you, are you going to? What are you suggesting? Are you gonna? Oh no! Her? I thought he was just gonna like take her dress shopping. I mm. thought it was cute. No, I read that as a very sexually charged moment, and it made me uncomfortable. No, I thought it was charming. I thought that he was just like, yeah, I'm gonna spoil my new bride. I'm gonna mm. buy her stuff. No, I did not read it that way. That's okay. I have a dirty mind, and I'm a terrible person. That's okay. They also tell her that she has a most unusual name. Indeed, they do, because it turns out that her given name is Cinderella again, uh, which I hate. Why do they keep drawing attention to the fact that it's weird? Because it is weird. It is weird. Also, she could just have a name. There's nothing stopping you from naming this character literally anything that you want. So after the prince and Cinderella leave the room, the king and the chamberlain mutter wordly amongst themselves oh there's precedent and problems and oh it's so sad in other circumstances and just we get the sense that trouble is afoot yeah so this is the actual villain of the story now i i guess just politics in general world politics is the villain now Uh, the monarchy let's say the monarchy sure sure so chamberlain comes to cinderella's bedroom late at night to say that the king requests an audience But what actually happens is that he comes into her room and he needs to ask her a question of some delicacy. This is all highly inappropriate. Yeah, one, she's in her nightgown. And two, normally when you're asking someone in that time period a question of some delicacy, it is a, were you two getting Randy? And is he obligated by honor to marry you? It's normally a virginity-based question. Mm -hmm. But it's not. He asks her if she loves the prince. And she says, why, of course, who wouldn't? Which is a weird way to answer that. The Chamberlain is very anxious, and he says that he's understanding of her plight, and he finally gets around to the point, which her her sweetness and charm are making him very uncomfortable. And he goes, it's not possible for the king to consent to this marriage. And she responds with, not possible what does that mean it means it's not possible this is a very what syllable did you miss madam that's not what he says that's what Liv is saying that's that's what Liv says because at this point I was a million percent done with this movie but there were still a bunch of time left so I was in a bad place mentally at this point so the Chamberlain says your love is a fine and private thing and I wish that it could remain that way but the princess to make a marriage alliance with a princess or a blood royal and love can't always find a way and then he explains to her that their little kingdom is very small and that it's enjoyed peace but now it's being threatened and you know she might see love and happiness but he foresees war and destruction unless the sacrifice is made and she goes and the sacrifice is to be me and he's like yes so she needs to leave and they need to do it in such a way where he doesn't search for her because he will he will at this point 
for a little bit, I was concerned that they were going to kill her, that that was going to be the new plot was they try to kill Cinderella and we wind up with a Snow White, I go to kill you, but I can't because you're too sweet scene. But no, they're just going to give her enough money for a good dowry and then exile her somewhere. They told her that she would have to go beyond their borders. Mm -hmm. And Cinderella then says, okay, she basically says, "I, I agree to all these I agree to all the monarchy requests, but in return, I have a demand of my own. Tell him that I didn't love him. In song, obviously, we get another song because this is a really good time for a song. And this is 10 songs now, guys. This is 10. So the song is tell him that it wasn't love. Tell him that I lied. uh, Make him hate my memory. Make him glad he's free. But then she's also like, but I do love him. But tell him I didn't. But I obviously do. And this is a long song where where she leaves during part of it. I think this is why she's gone. Part of the song is her travel montage of leaving. We then cut to the king and he's sitting sadly at a table and the chamberlain comes in to tell him that, okay, it's done now. And the king says, she certainly behaved like a princess. Which is a weird thing to say. Yeah, that's weird. You kind of ruined her life, man. Yeah, you, you suck. And so we cut to horses riding fast, and it's the prince, and he's at the river dock now. He's at the border. The border, I guess. Whatever. The prince is furious with the king. He in no way believes that she doesn't love him. He understands exactly what the king has done. And Mm -hmm. he says, you've destroyed whatever love and happiness I might have had for patriotism. He goes, choose me a bride, choose whoever. I'm not going to choose. I'll do whatever you say. I'll go as far as the altar and no further. Your royal house will live with you, but die with me. He also refers to the ladies that he can pick as a rag bag of royal virgins, which that's a great collective noun. I just. Yes. That was a salty line. That was cold. That was this... incredible. He's just completely demolished any hope that his father has for a legacy. I mean, this is how a bunch of romance novels start with someone declaring, fine, but I'm not having any children. I'll destroy your line. And it's just, he did it really well. It was very effective. It It was was very effective. It was Like, what else can you threaten with in that point? So the prince is getting ready for the wedding and he's miserable and he's putting on his clothes. And you see as he's getting dressed, the Cinderella shoes are on a blue pillow with all his stuff. Both of them. Where did he get the second shoe? Both of them. Wait. So why are they there and why does he have them anyway? I mean, they're there so for- he's em- clearly like mourning. They're there for emotional reasons, but how did he get two of them? Did, well, did she, she have must have, the she other must have one had the other one and her? she was wearing them when she met his, <gasps> his parents. So she left them for him. I guess, whatever. So he goes to an empty church and kneels in front of the altar and he starts praying to Cinderella to be forgiven because he's going to marry somebody. He goes, it's only in fairy tales that the prince marries the lady of his choice. There are no private kingdoms. I have loved but once. I have loved but you. And I have lost you twice. And my notes go, oh no, I'm sad now. Because it's really beautiful. It's a very touching moment. Because normally when we get this, this story of she leaves and you're told that she is, oh, I don't know, marrying a Belgian or something. The prince throws a hissy fit and you lose a lot of respect for him. And yes. in this one, he completely just sails over that hurdle, just clears it with miles to spare. Just now that's definitely not true. That's definitely something she told you to make me feel better. I'm so sorry that I have to do this. I'm so sorry I've agreed to do it. I hope you forgive me. I hope you can live in happiness. It's, it was an incredibly touching moment. And I was frankly really mad that the movie made me have a feeling mm-hmm. after this Very much nonsense. Rude. Just yeah rude i was mad about it so then we cut to something it it's like a freeze it's a what is that kind of paint etching thing called i'm not i didn't major in art i mean it looks like an etching we then look at an etching for a while and then it fades into cinderella on a flower swing and i actually love this moment this was specifically designed to look like a famous painting from that time called the swing i can't pronounce this can you pronounce this no okay crap okay it's the swing by jean honore fragonard and it's a beautiful painting 
you've probably seen it. It's one of the most famous. It's a lady in a pink dress on a flower swing with flowers all up and down the things. And she's got a beautiful sort of flat cap and it's a beautiful painting. And so this looks exactly like that, which is what they wanted. And I like it. Mm -hmm. And of course we have another song because there is no God and my soul is withering. So the song is like, oh, the love we shared, the dream we dared was just a prayer that can't come true. And she gets like a flashback to the prince's face when he first saw her in the ballroom. The song continues, although our song is through, I can't stop loving you for I can't forget the melody. Yeah. And that's the song. So at this point, we have 15 minutes left of the movie and we were genuinely concerned, is this how it ends? Does she just stay exiled in, I don't know, France or something? Uh, we were genuinely had no idea what was going to happen next. So I guess props to you movie for leaving us in some sort of weird, unsure moment. Yeah, I was very worried. I was very concerned. I was like, is this, am I reading this right? Is this going to this this be way? like a lesson about how life isn't a fairy tale? Because I don't need that lesson from a Cinderella movie. I mean, spoilers, there is a Russian Cinderella that we're going to watch at some point if I can find it that does basically end with no love isn't real it's for babies grow up because it is a soviet era cinderella and uh i just yeah, haven't found it yet out. i haven't found it yet but it is it exists we're gonna watch it so heads up that one doesn't end well but good news the fairy godmother shows up in this wickedly glitter dress and it's just very silvery basically goes what are you doing here this is not how i planned it and go on goes on to complain if I'm not on the spot to take care of every detail, everything goes wrong, which, you know, I really, that resonated with me. I felt that. I felt that in my soul. Yeah. And Cinderella goes, oh, I'm unhappy. And the fairy godmother goes, well, of course you're unhappy. You're missing your own wedding. We find out that the prince is getting married today, but to the wrong woman. And why else would she be dressed in such a ridiculous fashion? And the fairy godmother goes, I suppose I shall simply have to rise to the occasion. It takes so much out of me. It was the same with Snow White. You girls never do what you're told. Men are so much easier. So we then just cut to church bells ringing and we get fancy trumpet fanfare. And the subtitles said that the bridal march was playing. It is not a bridal march. It is a dirge of some kind on a very out of tune organ but appropriate to the occasion. It is. And we see one of the princesses that we saw at the ball. She had this weird sort of basket cone pearl headdress thing. I, I, I gathered that she's supposed to be the Russian inspired princess. There was a pointy ovally thing that I took to be very Russian. I don't know what this weird cone pearl thing was going to be. It did seem Baltic of some kind. What frustrated me about these princesses was that they were like, we're going to find princesses from Europe. But all they found was just the whitest people in the universe so they didn't even try to find anybody who wasn't where's just... my princesses on parade i right. ask thank you thank you i we should just listen to princesses on parade just correct. for a little bit it's just a palate cleanser correct so the priest starts speaking in latin at this point i was praying for an exorcism just let anything happen i yeah. wanted there to be an exorcism the stepsisters and stepmother are at the funeral funeral okay at the wedding at the wedding <laughs> so close to being done uh they're crying a small child senses magic yes okay good and the fairy godmother appears in the back of the church and just sort of sidles into one of the pews and the dog runs up the red carpet for no reason this this doesn't this doesn't go anywhere go it's anywhere so that we know that the dog is there in case you are wondering where the dog is yep the fairy godmother then makes a is this a glass trumpet that she makes yes. is that okay cool so That's she makes a I glass got. trumpet and blows on it and everybody else can hear it at the for a, a second i thought that it was a magic trumpet and only certain people could hear it but everybody can hear it but the priest continues to speak in Latin and neither the princess who's getting married nor the prince react in any way, shape, or form. They're just deaf to trumpets at this point. It's what happens when you're a royal. I guess. So, but everybody else is alerted that something is happening and looks towards this weird glass trumpet, which, by the way, wouldn't make any sound because you need... Never mind. So 
Cinderella walks in the back of the church. She's wearing this beautiful wedding dress. It's white. It has lots of frills on the sleeves. It's got a beautiful V inset. I just, I really liked it. It was a gorgeous dress and a beautiful veil and her hair is all ringlety and pretty. And then she starts walking up the aisle by herself, herself. in a very wedding march kind of way. Like she's slowly yep. progressing up the aisle and John gets the prince's attention and has him look. But the whole time I'm like, this is so rude, honestly, because she showed up to another woman's wedding, wedding wearing a white dress, just walking down the aisle. It'd be one thing if she showed up and the prince turned around and ran to her. Yeah. But she's just going down the aisle by herself. It is the confidence. It's a power move for real. It's a power move. And so the prince, again, slack jawed and the other king, the king of foreign king, the foreign king. Thank you. He's he's the furious. away team. The away, <laughs> the away king. He's furious about this. The prince leaves the altar and races down and kisses Cinderella. And our home king is trying to smooth things over with the away king. The princess faints. The queen mother goes, "Is this over? What a relief! Yes, madam. What a relief. <laughs> you are so correct in everything." And, and so, the kings are basically like ready to have a war over this. Basically. And they're in some sort of side. They basically just go to a side room to have a fight. And the king and the ministers are going, well, it's unconstitutional, something, blah, 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 blah. And the fairy godmother is in the room because she's the fairy godmother. Why wouldn't she be in the room? And she goes, well, you're an absolute monarch. You can just rewrite the constitution. And people are saying, who is she? And the, everyone else is going, I don't know, but that is true she's right and she she says absolute monarchs should act absolutely it's very becoming and the, basically she flatters the king and the king is pleased by his concept of absolute monarchy which he already has at this point they're this... concerned about what to do with the other bride because there is another bride physically in the room i think this was my least favorite part so the way that the fairy godmother solved this is by making the terrible cousin fall in love at first sight with this new princess and vice versa. And she's made this with magic. She hints at it to us. There's like the tinkly sounds of magic because she says there's a very obvious solution and she directs the kings to look at them and the princess and the annoying duke are staring at one another besottedly. And she goes, it's love at first sight. I promise. Mm-hmm. Scale of one to ten, how much did you hate that? Uh, ten. I hated that because it completely overrode like their autonomy and consent and was just really gross. Thank you. That is also what I have in my notes. I'm glad we agree about this. Consent is key in all things. If magic overrides consent, you're doing magic wrong and you're evil. Well, they did imply she's the witch from Hansel and Gretel, so... Yeah. She might be an amoral being. Just gonna... helping people as she sees fit guys if you want to listen to us drink and just have conspiracy theory fests about the fairy godmother and her role in this and in all fairy tales pay one dollar a month and listen to our drunk ramblings it's gonna be great for us and for you if you join us you get one of these for every single episode so essentially the foreign king and our king bond with one another over the fact that they both essentially had shotgun weddings and they sort of have this blustery front over oh kids these days they don't they don't have any respect for duty or tradition There's, they don't have any of our backbone or respect for our things i don't know they do a really old man bit it's pretty funny yes um, and the awakening is like well we'll have the second wedding in our country it's and not the king exactly. is like oh that's cementing your great alliance and the awakening goes concealing your shame and then our king grabs the away king and gives him a big kiss on both cheeks which the away king is not prepared for and looks like absolutely horrified and infuriated by and i thought that part was funny so now the prince and cinderella get married it's very religious it's very religious there's a lot of latin father son and the holy spirit they married they kiss so the fairy godmother is kind of choked up about all this and the dog is there. And then we get another song. Just when you thought you were safe, it's their stupid Secret Kingdom song. Yeah, it is technically a reprise of the Secret Kingdom song, but it's this is 12 
in 120 minutes. So we got a song every 10 minutes, guys. And I, some of the songs were nearly 10 minutes long themselves. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So I did just a real quick count. Um, the Rodgers and Hammerstein Cinderella has eight songs. And I cut some of those, honestly. Guys and Dolls has nine, I think. The, nothing should have this many songs. This isn't a musical. This is this is an operetta, and it's horrible. We're finally blessedly done. We end with people leaving in some sort of dance or something. I don't even care. It's we the get- credits. We we see like all of the cast come up and bow to us as, as their part names. of their dance. Yeah, with their, nan- their names are on the screen. Who cares? Who cares? But we're finished. Doesn't matter. Their last song is once again comparing love to like the monarchy. They're literally one of the lines is a royal state of mind. It's just. They're equating ruling a country as a king to being in love. And it's weird. It's weird. And I didn't like it. But we are finished now. We are literally finished with this movie. Yes. So now we get to the highs and low parts. Yeah. Traditionally, you go first on these. Yeah, I can do that. Okay, so my high is just like the visuals. Like, I thought that they were very, very beautiful. I especially like the scene of Cinderella running down the stairs and everything with the flowers swirling around her, the petals. Yeah. It was very, very beautiful. I liked looking at this movie. That was an excellent scene. I wish I didn't have to like listen to this movie as I was looking at it. Do you think that if we had watched this on a one and a half speed, it would have been better? No, because then all of the singing would have been really high pitched and terrible. But it would have been done faster. I mean, that is true. We could have also just not watched it. That's if we're going for the best possible <laughs> option. All right, lows. What are your lows? My low was the stupid subplot with her having to like exile herself. I didn't need that. That was so stupid. Yeah. That was garbage. What about you? What are your highs and lows? So I think my high was the transition of, I wonder what the prince is doing today. I'll tell you what the prince is doing today. I thought that was fantastic. That was hilarious. I loved it. That moment made me genuinely happy. It was good. It was a good moment. My lows were the songs. Oh, God. Just... Especially that one song about how things have been and always will be and the, with just a whole bunch of characters that I hated because they existed and I didn't want them to exist showed up out of nowhere and sang at me with stupid Cockney Yorkshire accents. I realize those accents don't sound anything alike, but I wanted to be clear that is what these people sounded like. It was both painful and unnecessary. And it continued to be so for five times longer than it needed to be Mm -hmm. so my Mm -hmm. low is that specific song but also all the songs with maybe the exception of the oh ho ho I'm so happy that I'm gonna die song (laughs) yes I did enjoy that one that song I don't even know if I enjoyed it but my my roller coaster to insanity was really entertaining during that you know plummet that part was fun for me if there was a good song it was that one I'm not convinced that there was a good song agreed agreed So what would you change about this movie? I would just snip it. I would just snip the last 30 minutes and just have them get married and just be done. Yeah, absolutely. That is the correct answer is they go to try the shoe on the stepsister's house. They also try the shoe on Cinderella. It fits and we cut to their wedding. This movie even has an actual reason for him having a hard time recognizing her because when he straight up does think that she literally is a princess, when she's dressed like a servant and two she was wearing wigs on like a ton of like white makeup so yes I understand him having a hard time not with recognizing her and needing the shoes help well you've taken the right answer of what you would change so uh I would make this not a musical (gasps) oh that's a good answer too because this wasn't the sort of musical where the songs added literally anything Mm -hmm. um in in operas Everything is song, and the arias sort of contain the plot. The, the songs matter. 
plot wise they drive the plot forwards and in musicals they don't drive the plot forwards but they do set a very strong scene of what's going on but there's not 12 of them you horrible monstrosity they so, also had a bad habit of telling us exactly what was going to happen in the song and then singing it and then recapping it and then having a reprise and then recapping Ugh. that so yes. i would say percentage wise i think 30 percent of this was song and it could have all been not song and you could have spent some of that time i don't know making an interesting plot or making a good shoe montage you could have made a plot that made sense you could have made a shoe montage why was there a dog i wanted the dog to do something oh i like the dog i don't care that the dog didn't do anything i enjoyed that the cinderella got a dog i think all cinderellas should get a dog i don't disagree with you i just thought that the dog was going to play some sort of pivotal role and i think you can argue that maybe he did because he brought cinderella to go find the shoe there's no reason she couldn't have just stumbled on it by herself so that was I don't... her emotional support dog Okay, but we didn't get any scenes of him being emotionally supportive to her. It just happened in other scenes that we didn't see. That's not how movies work, (laughs) Tom. All right. Should our listeners watch this movie? No. Yeah, I'm going to have to go with no on this one. It's too many songs, and it's not that good outside of the songs. And the songs are really, really bad. They really are. If you can find a clip of the one that they sing in the mausoleum, I guess go for it. Yeah, watch that clip and then be satisfied that you've experienced the high of this movie and move on with your life. Yeah. Would you ever watch this again? So I will probably watch this again when I make someone else watch it. I will definitely not watch this again, again, again. So I'll never, I will not watch this two more times but I will almost certainly have to watch this once more before I die. <laughs> you don't what have about you? to. What about you? I, it's going to happen. I can just, I can feel it. This movie is bad enough and weird enough that I know I will have to watch it again for some various weird, probably self-imposed reason, but not twice. I'm never watching this twice. What about you? Do you think you'll ever watch this again? No. I mean, maybe if somebody paid me to. <laughs> like never say never, but no, there's no reason to. Yeah, you're much smarter than me. What is your final grade for this movie? This movie is a solid C. It is completely middle of the road. It is neither good nor bad. Wow. It is just so, so long. You can just turn it on and sit there with your eyes open and it happens and it's a movie. Wow. Okay. A C. Yeah, that's where I am. Okay. Where are you? I'm at a D minus. I hated this. I hated it because I wanted to like it. I was so excited about this movie. I thought this was going to be an interesting new oh, take. Oh, you had story. hope. I had so much hope. And this movie just took those hopes and spit on them and crushed them up and drop kicked them out of a window while making fun of them on the way down. And I was furious about it. And while there were things that I liked, they somehow only made it worse because it just went on forever and everything else was awful. So even the things that I liked about this movie somehow made it worse for me. I'm not going to fail it because I didn't hate literally everything about it. There were some redeeming features. The costumes were lovely. Her voice was lovely. The scenery was lovely. But the problem is the scenery was happening during the movie. So, (laughs) and the costumes were happening on people who were in the movie. And she was singing songs that were in the movie. So none of it managed to escape the movie. So D minus. I hated this. I'm angry about this. Wow. Yeah, I thought it was fine. Well, it's almost midnight. So thank you for joining us. If you like this episode, please leave us a rating or a review. We'd love to hear from you. So follow us at Cinderpod on Twitter and Instagram. Like our Facebook page or email us at the Cinderella podcast at gmail.com. If you want bibbity bobbity bonus episodes because you want more of this for some reason, I guess. If you want this with swears. Yes, this with swears. Support us at patreon.com slash cinderpod in order to get access to our Ever After Party. Our intro music is Bad Ideas by Kevin McLeod. You can find him at incompetech.com. So Liv, what are we watching next week? We are watching Cinderella's Feller from 1940. I'm hoping it's not as bad as this nonsense. It's supposed to be some sort of 
gender switch role reversal of Cinderella, but it's from the 1940s, so I don't have high hopes, so not very far to fall. And it's short and not a musical, so I'm excited. Let's just leave it at that. I'm excited to watch Cinderella's Feller from 1940. How bad can that be? <laughs> well, until next time, we hope you have a happily ever after.